three, two, one, zero. The process of solving a real-life optimization problem starts by casting this problem in mathematical terms, which leads us to modeling or formulating an optimization model. So let's consider the following example. So we have a company that needs to design a can using the minimum possible amount of aluminum. So this could be a can for some soft drink, let's say. So the can has a cylindrical shape and the cylinder is defined by two parameters, the height and the diameter. Then using these two parameters, we can express the volume as follows. So you have pi d square over four is uh, the area of the disc. And then this needs to be multiplied by h, the height of the can to obtain the volume. And then the surface area would be the sum of surfaces of the discs on top and the bottom, as well as the rectangular side. So the area of the discs, there are two of them, and the area of which would be pi d square over four. So we multiply this by two to obtain this part. And then the side is a rectangle with the sides given by h and the circumference here, which is given by pi times d. So the total area of the side is going to be pi dh, and the total surface area is given by this expression. So then there are some design constraints that need to be addressed. These are some functional and aesthetic considerations. And according to these constraints, the height h must be at least 50% greater than the diameter d, but it cannot be more than twice as large as d. All right, so and then the volume of the can must be at least 330 milliliters. And even though we say here at least 330 milliliters because we are minimizing the amount of material that we are going to use to produce this can, we expect this volume to be exactly 330 milliliters in the optimal solution because clearly the higher is the volume, the more material you would have to use and we are minimizing here. So how do we formulate a mathematical model? we start by defining what we call the decision variables. All right, so here we have a decision to make, right? And we need to break this decision down into the parts that we can control and that we cannot control. Naturally, we need to focus on the parts that we can control. And of course, this is easier said than done in real life because nobody is going to give you the information on what you can and cannot control on a silver platter. That's something that you need to figure out. But for the purposes of this course, we will usually assume that at least you have all the information that you need about the system that you are studying. And this information is perfect in the sense that we assume it to be given and certain. So we just need to figure out what are the parts that we can and cannot control in this perfect setting. All right. And in this example, it is pretty straightforward to distinguish between controllable and uncontrollable. It's clear that the design consists in deciding what will be the value for H and the value for D. So H and D would be natural decision variables to choose here. And then there are issues we cannot control. The description of the design itself is something that we were given and we need to address, but this is not something we can change. Instead, we can just use this information in the model and we need to make sure that we use it properly in the form of what we call the model's parameters. Okay, let's spell out our decision variables here. So the decision variables would be D and H. And we actually need to decide the appropriate units of measure for our decision variables. So the volume is measured in milliliters and uh, given the fact that uh, one cubic centimeter corresponds to a milliliter, it makes sense to measure the diameter and height in centimeters. 
also when we specify the decision variables we typically need to specify the type of variables and we'll distinguish between different types of variables uh, the variables can be real or integer so in this case the height or diameter can be fractional they don't have to be integer numbers therefore these are real variables moreover neither height nor diameter can be negative so we can say that these are real non-negative variables also when we decide on the decision variables we need to make sure that the variables we introduce can be conveniently used to express our objective and constraints and in this case our objective is to minimize the surface area and the surface area is naturally expressed through the diameter and height so let's denote our objective function by f of d and h and our objective is to minimize this function so once again this is what we call the objective function and it must be expressed through our decision variables we can see that in our case the objective function is quadratic because we have the quadratic terms d square and dh so it's a non-linear quadratic objective all right so once we stated the objective we can express the constraints that our decision variables must satisfy in order to have a feasible design and the first requirement asks to make sure that the height is at least 50 percent greater than the diameter which can be expressed mathematically as h is greater or equal to 1.5 d okay now we mentioned before that there are parameters that we cannot control and in this case 1.5 is one such parameter so this parameter comes from the design considerations that were passed on to us we have to use these parameters in the model but that's something that we cannot change all right so we have our first constraint normally when we write down the constraints we move all the variables to one side to the left and then keep the constants on the right so this constraint will be equivalent to h minus 1.5 d is greater or equal to zero all right so we have our first constraint stated then the second requirement is that h cannot be more than twice as large as d so h is less than or equal to 2 times d which is equivalent to h minus 2d is less than or equal to zero so the first constraint was of greater than or equal to type the second constraint is of less than or equal to type but we can easily switch between the two types by multiplying both sides of the inequality by negative one for example i could have written this constraint right here as less than or equal to constraint by multiplying both sides by negative one and obtaining 1.5 d minus h is less than or equal to zero and finally the last consideration that we need to express is that the volume of the can must be at least 330 milliliters so this is when units of measure become important very important because this formula for the volume here if you want to have the volume in milliliters then we need to make sure that uh, the diameter and the height are expressed in centimeters because again you know the cubic centimeters correspond to milliliters and we write down the constraint the volume which is given by pi d square h over 4 is greater or equal to 330 and this expresses our last constraint so we can see that this constraint is actually cubic d square times h is a cubic term so our model here is highly nonlinear. so we have the quadratic objective then we have two linear constraints and one cubic constraint and then we keep in mind that both decision variables are non-negative all right so once again we defined our decision variables h to be the can's height in centimeters and d is the can's diameter in centimeters then we formulated the objective function that represents the surface area that we want to minimize 
and uh, then we express the constraints by stating that h is greater or equal to 1.5d which is the same as 1.5d minus h is less than or equal to zero so we decided to express it as less than or equal to constraint here then the height cannot be more than twice the diameter so we express this again as a less than or equal to constraint minus 2d plus h is less than or equal to zero and finally we have the constraint for the volume as a result we obtain the following model here and as you can see we don't list the non-negativity constraints because they happen to be redundant for this model because if you look at the last constraint then we have d squared times h on the left and d squared is always non-negative right so this product must be positive and greater or equal to 330 from here we can conclude that this constraint implies that h must be greater or equal to zero there is no way you can satisfy this constraint with a negative h right and then from the second constraint here we can tell that d is greater or equal to h over 2 which is greater or equal to 0 this implies that d being non-negative also follows from our system of the constraints therefore we just drop this non-negativity constraints because they were redundant all right so here we have our first optimization model